Her and EU, a European podcast on gender equality. Brought to you by the Martin Center with Loredana Teodorescu. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this first episode of Her and EU, a new podcast on gender equality and women's role in the society. I am Loredana Teodorescu, research associate at the Martin Center for European Studies. I'm also the head of EU and international affairs at Istituto Ligi Sturzo in Rome and the Secretary General of Women in International Security Italy, also known as WISE. Why this new podcast on women, you might wonder? And here is the answer. Discussions on gender equality recently gained a new attention in European debates. The von der Leyen Commission has made it a central component of its ambitious program and women leaders are gaining more visibility. Yet, they remain underrepresented in many positions that shape politics, economics, and society. And how is this affecting all of us? What are the main obstacles and what can be done to overcome them? We will address this issue from different angles, starting from women in EU politics. Is there a space for women in politics and at the decision-making level? Is their voice heard? And are the institutions reflecting the diversity of the society? Let's discuss it with Roberta Mezzola, our first special guest. Roberta is first vice president of the European Parliament and also a member of the executive board of the Martin Center. Roberta, thank you so much for being with us. Let me say that I'm particularly glad to launch this new podcast with you, uh, not only for the role you play, but also for the message you embody. So let's start from your own personal experience, as you have an impressive career. Looking back, what have been the ingredients of your success and how being a woman has affected your career? So first of all, thank you, um, Loredana. Thank you to the Martin Center for uh, launching this, uh, I think, extremely topical uh, subject uh, at a time when the whole world is looking at the European Union to lead on subjects such as women empowerment, women across the board, as I like to call it, and also making sure that our uh, policymaking, our laws, our decisions actually make sure that there is equality right at the heart of them. Uh, it is, this is, might be language that, is, uh, um, that one could take for granted, but as we live every day, you can't take that for granted, and we still have a lot to do. Uh, I've been in politics uh, since, uh, let's say, my teenage years, uh, when uh, I chose to, to fight, I'll use the word fight, uh, for my country, to enter the European Union. Uh, there was a big debate going on at the time, and my generation uh, at that time, uh, the younger generation, saw that the only way for my country um, in order to, to, to have the best shot and the best opportunities is uh, to be at the table, at the, the table with the rest of the decision makers. Those decisions can be taken without you being at the table, but then you can't influence them. And I think that's uh, the motto that I have used and the principle that has served me best uh, in in my, uh, let's say, you call it a, a career so far, uh, but also not only my professional life, but also uh, in my private life as a mother of four boys uh, who has, let's say, a, a very European family uh, with, uh, with our challenges, of course, with the big responsibility, but also as being part of a political family that has always placed each and every individual at its center. Uh, and it is that politics that I think myself and my colleagues, um, whether men or women in the European Parliament and in the European People's Party, have pushed in order to characterize what we do. Yeah, I would say that you are part somehow of this wind of change that we are experiencing at EU level uh, with powerful women in leading political positions, starting, of course, from von der Leyen, the first woman president of the European Commission, who was elected in 2019, breaking this long-standing absence of women in the top positions in the EU uh, system. However, if we look at data, uh, data shows us that there, you are still part of a minority. And why is that? I mean, what are the main obstacles, in your opinion, and how is this affecting all of us in the end? You are so right in saying that uh, Ursula von der Leyen provides um, a picture and a model uh, or that the whole world could follow. Uh, if you look at the, at when you when you see the European Union today, and you see, for example, we had last week in Strasbourg such a strong state of the union, powerful message 
delivered um, uh, by such a committed pro-European, it made us all proud, and it made me proud also to be part of the same political family uh, as Ursula von der Leyen. She's such a role model, model to, to all of us. Um, but as you say, uh, we still have a very long way to go. Uh, we still have um, many, many, let's say, panels, discussions, which uh, uh, do not feature such equality that, uh, let's say, we would, we would need uh, and the whole world would need. But that's my responsibility. My, my role is not simply to sit back and complain. My role is to make sure that the struggles that women who came before me um, overcame uh, in order for me and my colleagues to now be in a position of taking important decisions, I need to make sure I make them lighter for those who come after us, younger girls um, who are looking to European politics as a way where they would like to see, yes, stronger politicians, more convicted, where uh, principles and values remain central to their role. Uh, and I would like a situation where we don't even have to discuss how many women, uh, or men for that matter, are on panels, are in positions of management, of leadership. I would like a situation where um, the lists of candidates are equal in order to give as much of an opportunity for the voters to choose. I would like um, uh, to see a situation where merit and competence uh, and, uh, let's say, uh, trumps the the gender in that argument and that that, uh, that that discussion for our daughters will no longer need to be made. To be honest, however, of course, I thought growing up that this would already be the case. Uh, it's still not. We still uh, see, and if, especially after uh, once we are emerging from this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, that we have seen that women have been hit particularly hard. Uh, that the rate of domestic violence has skyrocketed, that we need to protect women not only uh, at the workplace, uh, in, uh, in, in the educational and academic field, but also in their homes. Uh, and that is our responsibility to address. I'm lucky, I think, to say that I form part of an extremely strong group of, poly of members in the current a European Parliament that uh, within our political group, but also across the Parliament, that have come together to push forward a similar uh, goals in order to make sure that our societies improve. Because if we want to be the world leader of values and principles, then I need to. We need to also prove it. Uh, and I mentioned before uh, positions and, and panels, but it's not only, of course, about photos. It's also about content, about policy, about background, and about how you can really use uh, those values and those principles and push forward the pro-European, in my case, Christian democratic uh, ideals in order to make it possible for everybody uh, to join our project. And this is my biggest challenge, but one that I am having, let's say, a great time addressing. And following up on that, uh, what can be done, in your opinion, in order to accelerate this process? I mean, how to engage more women in politics and in leadership positions? And where would you start if you had the power to introduce some measures? I said earlier that for me, the key word is women across the board. In other words, that I would like to see more women in all levels. Um, uh, within the private sector, within the public sector, uh, we in politics also need to be leaders in pushing for that reform. I think we should start uh, with making sure that we have more female candidates. Uh, that means that on every list uh, where you have an election, there is as vast an array of choice, also gender-wise, that we can present to the electorate. Secondly, to do that, I think we need to start young. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and this is something that I do quite a lot of, uh, I, I go to a lot of schools and I uh, don't talk uh, about partisan politics, but I talk about the greatness of uh, and the privilege that you have in order to be elected, that being elected is a mission that you should have to serve the people who put their trust in you, whether on a local, national, and European level, not necessarily in that order, um, but uh, perfectly in terms of identifying with your audience what they would like to hear so that they can go home after school, tell their parents, their family, do you know what? I would like 
to, to, to be an activist. I would like to be a defender of rights, and that progressively becomes, I would like to see my country doing better in this area. I would like to put myself out for an election. It is not an easy step, it is a courageous step, but if we create the right environment, uh, if we give the right guidance uh, and mentor our young girls, uh, in our societies, then I have no doubt that the numbers will immediately and naturally increase. You see it around. When there is a cause that is important uh, to young people, to young girls, to young boys, they are out in the street. They are campaigning for it. They are pushing for it. If they're not in the street, they're online. They are sending direct messages to their elected representative. Why are you taking this decision? Or this vote is coming up. I expect you to, to represent my views because I'm a voter. The next step would be come on board. Come actually on the same, uh, join our political organization, our, our um, platform, and present yourself as a candidate. And once you do that, once you feel that you have reached out to your audience, then those audience, that audience will place its trust in you. And that trust, it is up to you not to lose it. That's the biggest challenge in politics, but it's also the best responsibility you can have because we are accountable to those who put us here. And those who put us here expect us to deliver real change. And they will put us to task every time an election comes around, but not only when an election comes around. They expect us to deliver. Yeah, of course. And going back to this uh, institutional role that, that you play, um, I know that now the European Parliament has the highest number of women as MEP, almost 40%. And uh, what role can play, uh, more specifically, the European Parliament? You mentioned 40%. This is my third legislature, uh, and uh, uh, it is an extremely positive development. Uh, I was the first woman in my country to get elected to the European Parliament. Uh, we went uh, from one day as being the only uh, member state with zero female members to the member state who had three women members uh, in a day. Uh, and I believe that that brought about such positive change uh, that we actually went then in, as the country with the highest proportion of female members in, in the second mandate. Uh, that meant that there is no longer a question being put in my country as to whether women or men should be elected, but rather um, uh, my colleagues and I are elected because we compete on a level playing field uh, and we can be anybody's match, uh, both on principle, on argument, on activity uh, and on presentation. Uh, in terms of the European Parliament, yes, numbers are good. I would like them to be higher. Uh, at the moment, we are also discussing, uh, as we emerge from this pandemic, how we could improve uh, though that, uh, that configuration. Uh, I'm not necessarily a big fan of hard quotas. I want the arguments to be made to become natural to people who vote, to people who are elected. Uh, but I also understand that different countries are different. They have different electoral systems. And I would also like to see more women elected in national parliaments, in many national parliaments, that figure that we've just mentioned of 40% is much lower. Uh, so I would also like to spend, and in fact we do this quite a lot, uh, me and my colleagues uh, in the European People's Party group uh, actually travel across the European Union and encourage more and more women to enter, to enter politics uh, and, and actually push um, a change that comes at the, at the lowest level, we believe, in the principle of subsidiarity, pro politics closer to your level. I think this is one of the biggest things that we need to change. Yeah, indeed, also because uh, if we look at numbers at national and local level, of course, they are uh, lower and there is still a lot to do. I was looking at the European Institute for Gender Equality Index and they say that we still need 60 years to reach, um, to reach gender equality at the European level. So definitely there's, there's a lot to do despite the significant progress that which are, are for sure there. Uh, today you are, uh, I would say, an amazing inspiration for many girls and women, and you have a powerful voice on the matter. And was there anybody who inspired you throughout your life? I can mention two women, one on a professional level and one on a personal level. On a professional level, without a doubt, Angela Merkel. Um, we, you know, when you use the word trailblazer, um, she is really the person who I think blazed the trail uh, across the world. Uh, and that was because of her leadership, of her powerful values, of her courage to take very, very difficult decisions uh, because they were the right decisions to take. 
um, uh, the way that she pushed for inclusive or in inclusion uh, and uh, uh, respect for every person on the globe, uh, persons coming from all countries, no matter from where, no matter how big or small. It's the integrity of your voice that matters and the principles that you push uh, that should be um, the guiding light. And I think that that is uh, something that we will miss tremendously over the next years uh, on the European scene. On a personal level, I have to say my grandmother. Actually, both my grandmothers, to a different extent. Um, they, um, grew, let's say, brought up my parents in extremely humble, very challenging uh, origins. Uh, and uh, I really uh, admire the fact that their challenges are so big, but they still pushed, especially the women uh, in our family, uh, in a society where women did not go to school then, did not work or stopped working when they got married in order to bring up a family, uh, or simply uh, were not, let's say, given the same uh, level playing field as their brothers were. My grandmothers were both, um, let's say, models in that, and I owe them a lot. And I remember when I first um, ran for the European Parliament uh, on behalf of the EPP group, uh, and I was 24 years old at the time, I remember my biggest uh, fans were my grandmothers. They could not believe that in two generations uh, they had a granddaughter who had studied European law, who had um, uh, successfully, let's say, uh, pushed together with, with all my colleagues and all my, my young friends at the time, a generational shift in politics in my country towards a pro-European one, a visionary one, a future-proof one. Uh, and really, I am here testament also to their perseverance uh, and their belief in the fact that you know, no matter how, how um, let's say, small you might think you are, it's really, as I said before, uh, the integrity uh, and the power of your values and principles that matter. To conclude, I would, I would like to ask you if you have a message that you want to leave to our listeners, especially to young girls who would like maybe to become more active in, in politics. My message would be never let somebody else take a decision on your behalf if you can influence it. My biggest challenge, I think, and our biggest challenge is to convince um, uh, young people, an ever-increasingly uh, ever skeptical young audience, to vote. Uh, my um, message would be do not uh, let others take the decision that you should take uh, or encourage others to take and push to take. Uh, I think uh, the sky is the limit for our, all our young girls from all our countries and let's make sure that we, let's say, together with all our colleagues, smash as many glass ceilings on our way in order for them to have an easier uh, path than um, the people who came before us did. And it's now our responsibility to pass our baton over to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roberta, for your time, for the work you are doing, for this interesting conversation. And thanks to the Martin Center for making this podcast possible. Thank you all for listening. And we'll be back soon with a new episode of Her and You. So stay tuned. That was today's episode of Her and EU. Subscribe to our podcast for more.